Well, first things first, uh, you should vote. Uh, you should vote especially if you're young, register to do it, and do it. But with that being said... Democracy, and particularly liberal democracy, holds an almost mythical image today. Uh, it, it's cited as a goal to which societies should strive, and its absence is used by powerful states to justify invasion. I know the, the war in Iraq deeply divided opinion here and right round the world. But I also know that whatever views people have of how we came to this point, we all of us will want to embrace the birth of Iraq's new democracy. We must spread democracy to the uncivilised parts of the world. But can the priests of Western democracy really claim that their states are democratic at all? Right now the UK is festering in a turmoil between the tension of uh, representative and direct democracy uh, and further within that tension are multiple other tensions between what a vote really means, what makes a vote legitimate uh, and even what decisions should be left to the public in the first place. There are many it's issues true. at hand that, one, there is a tension between direct democracy and representative democracy, and that grey area has never been sorted out by any government. Really? And that is a huge part of really? why we are okay, well, where we are. You remember this? This is the booklet that went through oh, every door. I love door. that you've come prepared. I oh, have. my God. Well, I've got... Hello, darkness, my old friend. Until recently, questions of democratic legitimacy were sort of sidelined in UK political discourse. They came up every now and again, but the... The idea of real change was never really on the political agenda. We have a first-past-the-post voting system which has been said to have grown out of a particular British characteristic, which sounds like nothing but a direct appeal to class rule to me. This system has been criticised severely for being undemocratic and exclusionary. This piece examines to what extent voting alone can have an impact on the world and, and on our societies. Democracy is a god. So let's see if God's not dead. Why do you hate God? This is ridiculous. Why do you hate God? Answer the question. So the obvious place to start from a UK perspective is with our voting system, which is uh, first past the post. It's also a system used by many states that the UK has invaded and exploited over the years. This system, also known as single member plurality, is one in which the state is divided up into smaller areas known as constituencies uh, and each constitu constituency uh, and we're talking about the UK here but this applies in different contexts as well each constituency uh, is the battleground for an election to return one member of parliament it's a simple election in which the candidate with the most votes in the district wins winner takes all each MP is then returned to parliament and the party with the largest number of MPs usually forms the government. This system is designed to disproportionately benefit the largest party and sideline minority ones. The central argument in favour of this system tends to be that it provides clear avatars for power. It's clear where power lies when one party is in government, and if that government forms poorly, the public can then simply vote them out at the next election. Easy, right? Well, let's take a look at that. The system birthed by the Mother of Parliament. The very first point that you might find contention with, especially today, is that first past the post produces stable, responsive government. So that we have the strong and stable leadership we need to see us through Brexit and beyond. So I am today announcing that I will resign as leader of the Conservative and Unionist Party. Yeah. Britain is on the verge, Mr Speaker, of taking back control of our trade policy and restoring our independent seat in the WTO for the first time. Clearly, however, this concept has been hit with significant real-world counter-arguments with the massive par parliamentary turmoil over Brexit. A central argument in favour of this system is that it produces a government with a parliamentary majority and a mandate to pass a policy agenda that it sets out in its manifesto. Well, the current, <laughs> the current Tory government is headed by a Prime Minister who doesn't have a mandate 
beyond the internal machination, machination, machinations? Machinations, yeah. The current Tory government is headed by a Prime Minister who doesn't have a mandate beyond the internal machinations of a vampiric Tory party. <laughs> and on top of this, the, the government has lost every single vote that it's brought to Parliament so far and lost its parliamentary majority, which is very funny. One of the most concrete ways in which the sentiment your vote doesn't matter is expressed under first past the post is uh, exemplified by the election of Donald Trump and the 1951-1974 elections in the UK. In these situations, the, the party that won the highest share of the vote didn't win the election. This is the function of the winner-takes-all constituency basis of first past the post. In a constituency, the vote could be split at 50 point to 49.6 but the losing candidate will receive nothing from that that um, close battle it's all there black and white clear as crystal you get nothing you lose good day sir if there's loads of really close constituencies but a few where the losing overall party wins the, the seat by a large majority then the the winner of the election overall can receive a lower share of the vote than the losing party. This shouldn't be too unfamiliar a concept for anyone, especially in the wake of Trump's election, in which I think it was 2 million votes. You can Google that yourself. Hillary won by about 2 million votes but lost the election. You are fake news, sir. In my mind, an electoral system in which this is possible is, is unfit for purpose. It, it's not exactly democratic, is it? If the most votes don't translate to the most seats for a party, how can we, with a straight face, say each individual's vote matters? Let's dive down a little further. In the situation that I sketched out, in which the constituency election is close, your vote could potentially matter a lot. A case in which the vote could go either way is known as a swing seat and the individuals in such seats have potential huge impact on the outcome of an election. But in reality, most seats aren't swing seats. I think 2017 it was about 110 were uh, swing seats out of about 650. So, you know, most people's votes in that situation had less impact than people in those 110 constituencies. So, while your vote could potentially matter a lot in one of those swing suites, the chances of it having any sort of impact in a safe seat, no matter whether you vote for the winner or the loser, is low. On top of this, after the votes are counted, even in a swing seat, anyone who voted for the losing party effectively has no impact at all, because the winner takes all. You get nothing! You lose! Good day, sir! Indeed, anyone who voted for the winning party over the margin that they needed to win really didn't have any impact on the election at all either. That the winner takes all in first past the post effectively means that only a tiny segment of those who actually vote have an impact on the outcome of an election. For most people, uh, your vote likely has no impact on the outcome of elections at all. This also impacts the form that electioneering takes, campaigning often overly focused on issues in particular swing seats. This is an acute problem in the US where, where some swing states get a lot of uh, campaigning in the presidential election race and, you know, not much focus any other time. Education is our future. Farmers are this nation's backbone. Bankers, women, veterans, Filipino tilt to world operators are this nation's backbone. This, this has an effect though on the ability of the public to hold the government to account. Because if the government is only focused on what these people in s small number of swing states really want, then uh, and people outside that don't get as much of a say, then the issues that they're going to focus on are ones that are pertinent for the re-election. To what extent can the people really hold the government to account when messaging and voting only has a chance of impact in a select few seats? This effect is further exaggerated uh, if the two main parties and the system tends towards two, two main parties, it's called Duver, 
Duverger's Law. I think that's how it's pronounced. I'll put it up on the screen. Um, if the two main parties basically agree on the underlying assumptions of society, for example, both New Labour under Blair and Brown and the Tories at the time held very similar neoliberal assumptions about how politics and the economy should be structured. Britain's longest serving Labour Prime Minister is backing the economic policies of his Tory successor. In his memoir published today, Tony Blair praises David Cameron's plans to cut the deficit. Jesus Christ, Tony. They disagreed on a lot of the details, and those, you know, are important to to a degree. But there's no way that you could have any impact on the underlying functions of the state when both parties agreed on how it should be run. One of the great defences of First Past the Post is that it allows the public to respond directly to to the government, and I can't see how anyone can mount that defence with a straight face when in reality the system functions as it does. This problem is further confounded when you take into account the process of gerrymandering in which ruling parties redraw the constituency lines to benefit themselves. This often falls along class and racial lines. One of the most famous examples is the city of Austin in Texas, and Austin is known as a left, or, or at least liberal, sort of heartland within Texas, but so aggressively gerrymandered that they rarely, if ever, elect the candidate who best represents the ideological makeup of the city. As a result, Travis County's only Republican-held district, 47, soon grew to cover the entire western side of the county, and now includes Downton's home. Texas Republicans are finding new and innovative ways to manipulate Texas elections. We're not going to stand for that. The electoral power of the public is under constant attack by hostile established power. Moreover, this deliberate marginalization of minority ethnic votes is perhaps one of the most harmful uh, of, of the elements of first past the post systems. According to its sterile logic, minority voices can be heard if they're concentrated into small areas rather than dispersed through the country. Uh, this is a problem for parties if they wish to marginalize and sideline minority groups within society. Historically, mi minority groups have been deliberately ghettoized in certain areas, but under First Past the Post this might offer such groups stronger political power than such parties are comfortable with, which frankly is any political power at all. Gerrymandering allows such groups to be confined to particular areas while suppressing their political power, all while maintaining a facade of liberal democratic enfranchisement. A confluence of all these factors can have some extremely negative effects on politics. As I talked about in my last videos, one of the drivers of the rise of the far right is a lack of individual autonomy and an inability to exert any control over uh, over your life, which includes like polit in the political sphere. A first past the post voting system, particularly under neoliberalism, and particularly when both parties conform to neoliberal ideology exaggerates the extent of this inability to control any aspect of your life. Moreover, when the minority voting blocs are sidelined due to population spread or gerrymandering, then the consolidation of political power among a certain group, uh, you know, white and rich, is further supported. They can control political discourse. First past the post is a system that claims that it can provide stable, responsive government. But in the, as the UK context, the stability argument has begun to look fairly weak. Moreover, the idea that First Past the Post in any way is responsive begins to look like a sardonic joke when the extent to which an individual's vote has no impact is laid out. So if my argument has any force for you, uh, you should hopefully be on board with the idea that First Past the Post as a voting system is a big pile of trash that belongs in the toilet. When I say that your vote doesn't matter, what I really mean is that under an optimised democratic system, 
merely voting for a political party has an extremely limited effect. Under liberal capitalism, your vote has very little bearing on the state of your life. The first dimension of our lives over which we often have very little control and over which our vote can have only a distant effect is in our work lives. If you've been following my content for any amount of time, this argument will be familiar to you. In work, particularly if you are low-wage, insecure worker, you have incredibly little control over your life and over how the profit you generate through your labour is used. There are very rarely any democratic means of influencing how you spend eight hours of your day, five days a week, so sometimes more. This problem has become even more acute as trade union density has fallen and workers have fewer and fewer routes through which they can exert control over their work lives. Here your vote hardly matters because the economy in the workplace is seen as largely separate from the political sphere, but it's where we spend such a huge chunk of our lives and defines the conditions in which we live outside of work. Voting for a left-wing party will likely improve the conditions of your workplace if they get in, but that vote will not deliver any kind of systemic change necessary to challenge the very dynamic of your exploitation on its own. We need more than just tinkering to achieve justice, but a change in the foundations of society. Under liberal democracy, we're expected to vote every few years for someone to represent us at the state or local level. But how much democratic control does even that represent? I recently attended a lecture with Marxian uh, economist Costas Lapavistas, who made the point that under capitalism, and specifically under neoliberalism, the economy has come to be viewed as beyond politics. Costas knows this better than most, as he and his former Syriza colleague Yanis Varoufakis found when they were representing Greece to the EU. Both have recounted the story of being told that politics or elections can't get in the way of the economy. I could see Wolfgang Schäuble, the German finance minister, he was looking at me with uh, you know, eyes uh, that felt like laser beams. And he, he gets the floor and he said, one sentence, one sentence which is the one that I'm going to leave you with. Elections cannot be allowed to change economic policy. These were democratically elected representatives of the Greek people who were told by unelected bureaucrats that the democratic will they represented was completely subservient to the unknowable and often uncontrollable will of the economy. Indeed, this tension is replicated within the state as well. State central banks like the Bank of England or the Fed in the US hold a massive amount of unaccountable power and are close to the ears of elected representatives. Some claim that these individuals are apolitical because they don't intervene in party politics. Uh, and that point is just maddeningly naive. Of course, the heads of central banks have a political agenda. It's the agenda of capital, and they will act in accordance with what they perceive is best for capital. They're not bound to the democratic will of the people. We may vote for a transformative left-wing government, but unless they have the pol political vision and ability to take on the power of central bank governed by the wishes of capital, our votes will only ever have a limited impact. This effect is replicated through other organs and institutions of the state. The police, the army, the civil service and the courts all possess a huge amount of power over the daily lives of the people and yet we have no real democratic control over these institutions. Do the over-policed, marginalised, working class, black and ethnic minority groups get to vote on how the police patrol their area? Do they have any say over which Westminster Clark drafts a bill that will directly impact their lives. Of course they don't. The organs of the state are often distanced from the direct democratic control of the people. Moreover, these institutions are almost always controlled by people who grew up in the vestiges of privilege. The privately educated make up about 7% of the British public, yet they dominate the top jobs in the courts, in the civil service and in the army, and in the media as well, which is an important point. Even if I'm extremely generous and assume these people have no overt attachment to capital's agenda,
they will likely have internalized its logic. Arguably, they would have to, or they wouldn't get into the positions in which they occupy. This argument is made incredibly visible in the UK. Take, for example, the recent opening of Parliament. This sickening vomit of opulence, pomp and circumstance brings into sharp focus how the very functioning of our parliamentary system is designed to be exclusionary and intimidating to anyone outside of the ruling classes. This goes beyond just the ceremony to the antiquated day-to-day -day functioning of Parliament, but it's more than just that Parliament needs modernising, but the expression of a state that's designed for and by capital. When our state is designed as such, then the efficacy of simply voting as a method of social change comes into sharp focus. No political party can truly dismantle all these systems on its own, no matter how large its mandate, because it has to exist within them. There can be reform and positive change, but the tension between a party and the political system is such that existing within it will naturally bend the party to the shape of the state. Voting shouldn't be the start and end of political participation, especially when there are so many areas in which an individual's vote does not touch and when state institutions exist to support capital. The power of your vote is undermined not just by the voting system, but the structures of state and capital's ability to shape politics. So in conclusion, you should vote. I'll say again to be clear, you should vote. But in our current system, voting is not nearly enough to produce the kind of societal change we need. The first past the post voting system is representative of how shallow our democracy really is. In many cases, your vote simply doesn't matter. We live in the illusion of democracy, in which we are told we, the people, hold the power. But this has never been true. We need a system in which power is decentralised and dissipated throughout all areas of society, including the economy. I say it's not to put people off voting, it's often impossible to know whether your vote will make a difference, uh, and we need people, particularly the young people, to vote. But it's essential to realise that voting on its own, even if we had a more proportional system, is not enough to bring about radical political change. Political participation should be more than voting. Join a union, spread the message, organise and march, and we the people can change the world. Okay. Thanks for watching. Not sure if there's going to be one or two videos yet. If it's one, then thanks for sticking around for what looks like it'll be quite long. Um, as ever, like and share and comment and subscribe and all that. Cheers. Oh god. I've just gone numb from sitting here. Oh, I'm on the floor.